as uh, I was introduced, we will talk about a very controversial, I think, and a very uh, hot topic in the world of blockchains, which is privacy. Okay, I think that, so let me just give a couple of words to frame uh, the problem, and then we will begin discussing. We were, uh, we, we all already began discussion <laughs> during the coffee break, so we gave up our coffees just to talk about this, and then we'll, of course, involve all of you. And I think that uh, privacy is one of the most complex, faceted, and uh, uh, controversial issue in, uh, in the blockchain world for different reasons. Uh, we heard talking about uh, the possibility to apply this technology to new models of identity uh, that will offer possibilities not seen before. And uh, a question immediately arises, but if it is true that everything is immutable, everything is transparent, which are two uh, uh, features, two peculiar features of blockchains, how is it possible to kind of uh, make this quick assist with uh, the basic uh, property to uh, control access over personal data. Okay, so this is one thing that immediately comes uh, to mind. On the other hand, so it's prob how it is possible. Privacy is not possible, okay, one would say. The other aspect is if we think about the, 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 the first uh, application of blockchain, which, is, which was Bitcoin, um, we uh, usually see that associated with uh, uh, the opposite problem, okay? In Bitcoin, uh, you have pseudonymous identities, anyone can uh, uh, create an account and uh, move money in any way possible. So from that representation, from that point of view, it would seem that we have too much privacy on a blockchain, okay? On one hand, we have two uh, little privacy, no privacy on the other hand. On the other hand, we have too much privacy. Uh, so we have this tension, these different points of view. Do we have too much privacy? Do we have too little privacy? Which applications? It, the matter is very complex, I think. And uh, so I will introduce the uh, guests with which we will talk about this topic. Francesco Bruschi, it's me, of course. So <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm. Uh, and then we have Heather Dahl, uh, CEO of Indicho. Welcome, Heather. Then we have uh, Philippe Thevots, um, uh, Vice President uh, of uh, SIGPA, correct? Okay. And then Sinchiro. Yes. Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> Matsuo, which is a research professor of computer science at Georgetown University. Right. Okay. So I would say, having uh, said so, privacy is a complex problem, it changes. Uh, with the points of view to which you approach it. Um, the first question I would make to my fellow panelists are, is uh, in your uh, professional experience, in your, from your point of view, is this really a problem? Is this something that can be solved? What do you think about this? Philip, if you want to. So thank you. Maybe first I, I will say a few words about uh, the ecosystem where, where, where I'm working so that uh, one could understand uh, my, my, my answer. So as you said, I'm working at, uh, at SIGPA uh, in Switzerland and probably nobody knows who is SIGPA, but you are touching our product every day because we are securing banknotes through Security Inks. And uh, one motto of uh, SIGPA is to enable trust. And in fact, the idea is to make such that you trust that this is indeed a genuine banknote uh, there. And when I see uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the motto for this, uh, this, uh, con uh, this conference is uh, supporting responsible, trustworthy innovation. In fact, we are exactly, and I'm exactly into this field because my uh, duty is to uh, design and propose solutions to government to enable trust in the digital ecosystem. Uh, so in, in digital uh, uh, solutions, so we are exactly at the heart of, um, of, uh, of uh, this, um, uh, the, this uh, problem. And um, I'm especially acti active in uh, designing solutions for um, uh, preserving the privacy 
for instance, in identity, but as we have seen in a previous panel, identity, this is not only identity of people, but this could be identity of things, it could be identity of data, and uh, so it's covering a lot of, um, of topics. And then the idea, once you, you, you care about the identity, is um, what's going on with uh, these people, these things, this data, when they travel through a supply chain or through through a given transaction and, and where the, the privacy is, uh, is important. One other thing which is important because we, we may talk a little bit about it later is through my many contacts with, uh, with Estonia, I have a deep knowledge about how they use blockchain on a daily basis since almost 15 years, since uh, beginning of 2008, even before Bitcoin was uh, published and Bitcoin was born. Um, so uh, we will see a little bit uh, uh, what it means. So now to go back to your, your question, is privacy a problem with blockchain? Uh, if I would be a little bit provocative, I would say there is no problem at all. Why? Because, to my point of view, with a good governments, governance, uh, there should be no private data on a blockchain. No, these data should be put somewhere else, but not at all uh, on a blockchain. And the blockchain should serve as a trust anchor. We can talk also about root of trust, which allows to prove that this data my, which could be my identity or, or whatever else, are indeed genuine and have been certified by whoever is, um, has, um, has done it. So the, the one thing which is important is the blockchain being used as a trust anchor, it allows me to have my data into my pocket, into my phone or, or wherever, into my control. And when I expose it to whoever, the blockchain allows me and allows the person in front who acts as a verifier to check that indeed what I claim, what I show is indeed genuine and um, have been time step in a given time and have been issued or certified by a given uh, entity or, or, or authority. So the, the, the data are in my pocket and they are not uh, stored um, anywhere on the, the blockchain itself. They could be stored in securely at the issuer's place, but they should not be at uh, in in the um, uh, in the blockchain uh, uh, itself, uh, so this means that uh, in terms of privacy, if it's done right, there is no uh, problem about it, and we will see how in the recommendation this appears uh, later on. Okay, thank you, Philip. That's a very very strong position. Um, so we will get back at at it later. So you will be. Uh, able to give us more detail. Now, Ether? Right. Um, blockchain has really enabled us to have more privacy, more control, and more security on sharing data than we ever have. And, and that may catch some off guard thinking, well, but everything's out in the open. Well, Maybe that was the case 10 years ago when you looked at blockchain. But it's really, really important to remember that if you're on the lines of saying blockchain has to be completely open, that everything has to be written on the chain, that's a very dated view. That over the past three, especially the last two years, the amount of progress that has been made to share verified, immediately actionable data, including human identity, that does not have to be written on the chain, is in progress. It is going on today. There are multinational companies using this. And so, no, there's not a problem with immutability or privacy on blockchain, maybe there is on particular chains, but to put that on the entire blockchain technology is not an accurate statement. Context is what's so important 
when talking about blockchain technology, especially when, you, when one may make blanket statements about immutability or privacy. Let's talk about the use case. Let's talk about the problem. Let's talk about what we're trying to accomplish. And remember, there are so many different variations of chains and ledgers that can be used different architectures which can be applied to that use case, and also governance, both from a policy, and I should say a human standpoint of governance, but also machine-readable governance combined, makes it where the statement of privacy and immutability isn't possible in chain. That's not accurate. In fact, all of those things together, when used in the right way, make privacy to the point now in technology at a place that we have never experienced before. And I am very excited to see the amount of privacy that is being built in that in fact exceeds many of the regulations and compliance that companies have to meet now that are required by governments. So I am very excited about what's happening and saying that I think we need to start advancing our conversation beyond um, being hung up on privacy or immutability. And let's talk about how we bring all the technologies together to advance the goals. Okay. Also, yours, it's a very positive and optimistic uh, view, very strong, in some ways uh, resonating with what right. Philip and, said. And I, I say that because I'm not looking at maybe one or two really common blockchains that we read about in the news all the time for cryptocurrency. I'm looking at the entire industry of blockchain and what's happening. Sorry, just to clarify a bit. So you are saying that privacy depends uh, on the applications right. and on the technology and on the blockchain. So for instance, if we talk about permissionless uh, blockchains, the most famous permission to right. uh, technologies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, do you think that's uh, there? Is there a problem with this technology or we can solve this with the correct application as I, it seemed to me that Philip implied, right? Right, you have to separate blockchain from Bitcoin. They're not the same. They're, Bitcoin uses blockchain. Bitcoin is not the blockchain. It is yeah, not the technology. So we can debate the implementation of blockchain in Bitcoin. And I would say there are areas of Bitcoin that can be improved with other ledgers, with other approaches to blockchain in addition to Bitcoin. But I want to make sure that we separate the two, that we're here talking about not just Bitcoin or Ethereum. We're here talking about the blockchain technology beyond one implementation of it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we will go back at it. Now, I would like to go uh, to also ask uh, Shinchiro, what okay, do you so think? It's not easy to say something after that very strong and positive <laughs> no, opinion. You have to say there's if, a problem, I otherwise talk, the talk, panel talk is some, over. <laughs> if I talk something positive, that this is a just a festival <laughs> of, 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 of something, but anyway, that Thank you for introduction. So I'm a, I'm a, my background is cryptography and its application. I'm researching this area over 25 years. And uh, you know that, so I, and I'm a director of the Blockchain Research Center at the Georgetown University called CyberSmart. And I'm also a co-chair of the Blockchain Governance Initiative Network. This is a multi-stakeholder dis discussion place like that, for example, uh, Internet governance, IGF, IEEE, I, I, IGF, ISOC, ITF uh, for the internet. This I, I'm, I'm organizing that similar kind of body for blockchain governance by multi stakeholders. And uh, you know that, uh, okay, I would like to be a neutral from academic point of view for that, that discussion. And uh, from mathematic point of view, that is the mathematics behind the Bitcoin and blockchain originally. So it is a uh, a great uh, technology to achieve in immutability with eliminating single point of failure. That's it. There's no functionality for privacy. Of course, that Bitcoin developers uh, recommend the users to change key pairs for every transaction to protect privacy. This is not privacy enhancing technology or zero knowledge proof, but uh, this is a good uh, combination of the technology and operation to achieve immutability and privacy. This is the original idea of the Bitcoin for privacy protection and immutability. This is a good thing. This is a good example, but this is just for payment application. But uh, so after the Bitcoin, we have the 
many, many different types of application blockchain that which require that input have some private data on chain or off chain, something like that. That this is the reason why we need to consider that 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 difficult problem of the privacy protection for blockchain technology. And uh, so my long term headache over 25 years that I'm, I'm researching the privacy enhancing technology for long years. My headache is uh, so the, con the difference of the concept of definition of the privacy. For example, in European countries that there's some definition or some concept of privacy, but it is a little bit different from Asia and completely different from United States that there is no unified uh, definition of the concept of privacy. So I, I, I fully agree with, with that result that, so that, that design of the design to achieve privacy or design to achieve uh, some private something application, we need, to we need to align to the specific use case. Anal analysis on the specific use case is needed. So this is the reason why that at ISO IEC there is a standard for the privacy impact assessment. So we need to focus on the each use cases, so stakeholders, and uh, so requirement for privacy. And uh, so, you know, the privacy protection is a problem of the management or the governance. Of course, that some technologies, including privacy enhancing technology, cryptographic protocol, follow that analysis, but uh, we need to start with that each specific use cases. And of course, that, that definition of the privacy uh, d depends on the context and users. Anyway, that uh, and for the decentralized blockchain, uh, and but the blockchain technology is a global technology. This is mathematics is global. Anyone can use that, that same technology, and we need to have some layer or some organization to make harmonization among among different definitions of the privacy. This is my starting point of the discussion today. Okay, thank you so much. I completely agree with you with the fact that. Privacy, it's a very broad concept, very difficult to, to define, very difficult to pin down. Well, one thing we could, uh, for instance, in some uh, context, I think that almost equates, uh, is almost definable as uh, the ability of the individual to control the access to the information uh, about him. So I have some information, like Philip was saying before, I don't put it on chain, I just put some commitment, and then if I want, I can let somebody get in and uh, check that information. So being uh, able to control who can access your information could be something that it's not privacy, but is a proxy for privacy. I don't know if you, if you agree with this. And I also agree, of course, with the fact that uh, we have to contextualize regarding to applications, okay? So one thing in say is talking about identity, so I want to be able to show somebody something and uh, uh, not showing somebody else. I don't want anyone to uh, know or see what I, what I see. So I would like to propose to you a, a very uh, hot application, an, an actual application, which, is, which are CBDCs. Okay, so in uh, CBDCs, the idea is that we will be able to use uh, central bank uh, money represented as uh, token assets, uh, okay, what gives. And uh, uh, these assets will have uh, interesting properties, properties that are kind of akin to what we are used with, uh, with, uh, with cryptocurrencies, okay? So, for instance, the ability of the individual to um, generate an address and being able to receive money, send money. Here we will have some tension, for sure, okay? So on one hand, one of the things that uh, was shown is that people will probably care very much about their financial uh, privacy, okay? So the ability of not showing everyone uh, how much am I uh, earning, uh, to uh, which way do I use my money, and so on. On the other hand, of course, we will have uh, the uh, uh, anti-money laundering, we will have uh, the issues that we all know. So if we, I, I agree that we have to focus on application, what do you think about the tensions that could arise in, with, this, with respect to this particular application? Is it, it, it will be possible, will it be possible to kind of uh, uh, comply with the uh, uh, rules that we uh, have and, 
and at the same time give uh, um, privacy to, to, to users. What do you say, Phil? So the, the first thing when we are talking about CBDC, central bank digital currency, this means it is issued by a state. And this means that the state will decide what will be the rules to, uh, to use this, uh, this type of, uh, of money. If I go back to, to my bill, I can transact to anyone here or elsewhere in a fully anonymous way. But if I come with a suitcase with one million euro and I say, hey, let's transact together in an anonymous way, the rules are such that, in fact, it's difficult to do uh, because then when uh, the other person will go to the bank to, to put that in a bank account, they will say, where does this money come from? And does identify yourself, etc. So the idea for a, a, a CBDC in order to be widely adopted, again, and we talk about retail CBDC in this case, yes. is to replicate the, the uh, physical cash and thus to make such that I could transact a CBDC for a low amount of money in a fully anonymous way because and without any fear that I could be traced. If I would go uh, to the Red District uh, in, in Paris, maybe I will pay with debt rather than with a credit card huh? or with uh, some, uh, some digital money uh, because I want to be fully anonymous, okay? And thus, this uh, CBDC should have this privacy characteristic, but on the other hand, it should comply with KYC and AML rules. Thus, the CBDC could be designed in a way to be a programmable money so that above a certain threshold, whatever it is, then I should identify myself. But maybe there should be a first threshold where I should identify myself to uh, uh, an escrow system uh, where the state could know who it is, but the, the people with who I would transact would not know who I am. And if this is above a, a higher level, then I have really to reveal who I am and show my full identity uh, because this is a large amount of money and I have even to describe where this money is coming from. So this means that we should uh, have a way to have different levels of privacy depending on the, the, um, the, the application, but this will be defined by the state uh, because this is money issued by the state. And of course, for the cryptocurrencies, we don't have that because it's not the state which is behind that. And so it's all any type of jurisdiction which should find a way to, to, to go around that. If you think you have a couple of more questions, we'll go back to that in, in a second. Heather, what do you think about that? Right. I fall in the story that uh, Philippe set out on how do you know who this person is that you may assign the CBDC to. And um, my work, especially over the past two and a half years, has been directly with banks, financial institutions, global payment processors. How do they know their customer, KYC, to meet AML requirements? And how do they know that for a digital financial transaction? And so how do you attach the human identity to the actual currency and do so in a way that falls in line like Philippe talked about. Maybe there is a low level threshold, five euro, I'm going to say, that you don't need to know anything beyond this person shows proof of ownership over that five euro and has the ability and the authority to transact it. That's all you need to know. And that can be fed into a verifiable credential. And that verifiable credential contains all the information about who is behind that five euro, but has ZKP or zero knowledge built in so that for a five euro transaction, they just know it was connected to that person. But now let's go to our 500 euro transaction, you're going to need to know more information. 
And so we also have predicate proofs that allow you at that point to say, in order to make this transaction, I have to disclose my name, my address, my nationality, whatever the requirements are. And you can keep escalating what is required to make that transaction. This is built into the governance, not only in the policy governance, but the technical machine readable governance. And it's actually available technically now because financial institutions are actually using this technology with ledgers and blockchains to conduct these type of transactions internally inside their own institution. So what I'm setting out here isn't something that is a big vision or dream, it's what's actually going on. And the technology's also already been developed in the open source communities and is available and being deployed exactly to the use cases that Philippe set out with CBDC, but you can attach it to any type of valuable exchange. Thank you. You very uh, rightly, uh, according to me, mentioned technologies such as zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so we'll uh, get back at that. And uh, I, I would like to understand, but we will talk about maybe that in the, the next round, how much the possibilities, the potentialities of these technologies are clear to uh, legislators. Okay, I, it seems to me that we have some. Uh, it's not a cutting edge. It's not bleeding edge technology anymore. It's becoming more and more usable technologies, with which we can do actual things. We're doing actual things, and these things are sometimes paradoxical. Okay, it is possible to show that you haven't trespassed a given threshold without saying anything else about yourself. So, I would like to understand how. What is the cultural gap? Uh, how, is, is, it, is it clear to uh, rulers what, what, is, what it is possible to do with this technology? So I, we will get back at that. I would like to also listen to you. For CBDC? Yes, right? of course. Okay, so that it, it, it's a problem or it's issues of the governance. Okay, I would like to provide some interesting story in late 90s. So, so in late night, I was engaged in the first CBDC project, surprisingly. This is 25 years ago. My first, first, first professional job is de designing CBDC for Bank of Japan. I, I worked at NTT and, NTT and Bank of Japan did their experiment for the central bank issued current digital currency in late 90s. This is the first era of the digital currency. DigiCash, Mastercard, and Mondex, or, or Visa Cash was, were the ex had a experiment in the United Kingdom and United States, and at the same time, Japan holder uh, experiments like something like that, and we had uh, several thoughts on the privacy and uh, uh, how to prevent that, so double spending or something like that. But at the time that we use uh, just a key, just public key, key pair as a public key, public key cryptography, not real identity. But in the case that so the some double spending was found somewhere. So we uh, revoke that, that anonymity and that we link that ident real name and the key pairs with, with uh, approval by the court. So this is a one example of the governance mechanism. And uh, after that, so it, it's a late 90s, before the September 11, at that time, uh, that AML KYC was not po problem, but after September 11, that AML KYC became a problem uh, for, the, for the financial transaction. And uh, after that, in 2002, so please remember that what happened in Europe. So it was planned to add RFID tag to Europe, European banknotes. But that plan was uh, disapproved because of the privacy concern. Due to that, so anyone can link that, that different transaction by the same person. You know that, so privacy issue is, can, can be solved easily, but so we need to discuss more about how we govern that entire ecosystem of the financial payment. Because that so several potential privacy issues happen for the linkability of the transaction for, by same person. And of course, additionally, that we have that AML KYC issue after September 11. Anyway, that this is a, firstly, this is a uh, governance issue for specific use case first, then that, that the zero knowledge proof for other privacy enhancing technologies comes later. To, to achieve that some privacy goal. Anyway, that I'm, basically I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm optimistic to that applying that privacy enhancing technology to achieve the goal. But 
So to discuss about technology, so be, uh, before we discuss about technology, let us talk about that, how we govern that entire ecosystem. That's all. So uh, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I yeah. wanted to share a, a, a real case uh, about the education Great. or the awareness of our authorities. Uh, one and a half year ago, the Swiss population did vote, we vote a lot in Switzerland, uh, about an EID. And the, the vote was negative, and mainly this was refused because of privacy issues. And this was linked, and maybe the Swiss authorities will not be very happy of what I will say, to the fact that they were not aware enough of the latest technologies, and that's what they proposed was based upon uh, existing PKI uh, technologies in the hands of the private sector, and thus all the data would flow to the private sector, and, and people did not like that. And I think they were right not to. Uh, and now we are relaunching a, a new round for, to, to end up with some uh, EID, probably based upon SSI or, or around SSI, and there was a lot of learning from the government, but there still need to be a lot to go. Uh, um, and this is absolutely needed so that they design solution, they propose solution, which are really taking into account the latest um, uh, findings. And I think the, the work that we have done in the past, in the BEPAP, in these recommendations and in, in this conference are contributing for this awareness of they are uh, technologies which can solve a lot of these concerns. Just talk with us and, and we can help you, government. So you're optimistic about yes, this? Definitely. Okay. Uh, okay. You wanted to add I'm something? Call on the government question yeah. that you put out. Uh, yes, yes. yes Go I, ahead, I, please. Some of the most exciting, innovative work in this space is being done by governments. And that may be surprising, but there's some of the leaders and the government of British Columbia uh, are some of the uh, world leading in self-sovereign identity technology. The government of Aruba is leading on implementing digital travel verifiable credentials for border, um, and they're working with airlines to do so. Um, the government of Ontario and British uh, is said, here's our stack around decentralized self-sovereign identity as our identity, new replacement for the identity card. The state of Rhode Island um, is making the certifications for accountants, for instance, verifiable credentials using blockchain. But what's really interesting is governments are leading this space, very specific governments, and they are driving the adoption. And while other governments may not be as um, out front as they are, governments can learn from each other. And the thing is, is governments have the ability to drive the adoption of this technology. And I think that's the important part um, to remember here is how do you learn? The best way of learning is by doing. I completely agree. Just to be clear, I wasn't questioning the you know, goodwill of governments in trying to understand what these technologies are. So I completely agree with you that there are many uh, governative uh, initiatives that are driving the adoption. My, uh, so I'm not uh, putting that into question, okay? I was wondering if we have, what it seems to me is that we have very powerful technologies. Some of them are cutting edge, okay? Such as, let's talk about zero knowledge proofs, okay? Which I think will be a, um, a cornerstone in the ability of uh, um, allowing privacy and using useful data on chain. I don't know if you, I think we all agree on this, okay. So this is a super uh, uh, rapid changing and evolving uh, field, okay. And uh, uh, we are having, we are developing the tools that allow to do things that seem magic, okay. Like I show you, I show to you something, I prove to you something about myself. I prove to you that I am, uh, I don't know, I, I had a degree in a U, U country and I had a, an average vote of something uh, below or, or, or above something uh, without telling you anything else about myself. And you can be absolutely sure about this. So this is something that, that seemed magic 10 years ago. Okay, now it's a reality. We're seeing that adopted. And this 
tools, it seems to me that open possibilities design spaces that were not available before. Like, as Philip said, uh, the state has to decide. The state tells you, you can use CBDC under, below threshold, above the threshold, you have to identify yourself. How do you prove that you are below the threshold when you can create as many uh, accounts, public key, as possible, okay? It seems something that if you don't know it, it, it might seem uh, impossible to do. Like it seemed impossible, for instance, uh, asymmetric cryptography. I read some uh, uh, story about that. To even to the inventors, seemed impossible before they finally realized it was indeed possible. So what I'm saying is, uh, uh, I, I, I don't question the goodwill of uh, of uh, governments. I'm questioning if they know what it is possible to do. If they have a clear a view of the possibilities that these tools. And you rightly mentioned many examples that are uh, about super interesting applications such as self-sovereign identity, which I think is one of the most interesting thing we can have. But maybe is, is there some blind spot that we have to uh, clear, which we have to uh, lighten and or otherwise, we will end up with uh, a CBDC that this possible where this possible is okay. Okay, so I have that. I, I could provide that answer for that. So at the previous session, that the importance of a standard was discussed, and uh, for the blockchain and the privacy problem, that standard is needed. But unfortunately, we don't have any standard at ISO or as a standardized body. This is what currently so NIST and begin are doing to create a standard to understand, to have common understanding on their specific privacy enhancing technology. So what that what each privacy so privacy technology A can provide to blockchain, but cannot provide that. So all so all technology has have that limitations of its its ability. So the important thing is that we need to understand what it, what that pro, uh, technology A can provide, but cannot provide. You know that. So, not it is not all, but so some of that privacy enhancing technology company provide some misleading <laughs> advertisement to that that product A covered everything, but uh, there is no such silver bullet <coughs> in technology. That we need to have that some good technology standard to to identify that uh, that that pros and cons or so what that technology cannot provide and what is a missing point to achieve that privacy goal. That kind of uh, technology standard on operational standards needed because that technology can cover most, most part of that uh, problem, but the human operation is need, still needed for, for all technologies. So this is the reason why I'm mentioning for both technology and operations. Okay, uh, so we, can be quite optimistic <laughs> with this respect, I guess, and uh, so that that is what would you say? Yeah, I, I would like to to raise a question uh, or a problem for our policymakers yes. regarding Please. privacy. Is if we think about a national EID, so a national digital identity, again like a CBDC, an identity delivered by a state. So the state is deciding about the rules, and this could be an SSI-like uh, uh, solution, which allows to preserve totally my identity, uh, my, my privacy, and thus, if I'm using it to log to my favorite uh, chess uh, website, so that I can find under a pseudo, but I want to use it so that I find back my, my partners uh, uh, in play, I don't need to disclose any data, nothing, okay? and. I could make such that the trace that I leave, the metadata that I leave to this website cannot allow to link my different sessions, um, uh, but I can still connect to my, to my partners. I would say the state will say that's good that you can use your, your, um, your identity uh, this way. But now let's say that I'm using this chess website I'm a terrorist and thus to communicate and if I create a new game with this partner and I do this operation, it means 
uh, uh, start uh, the bad action. Okay, so this means that for national security reasons, the issuer of the identity may wish to be able to tell who is behind this usage of my EID. The website should never know and should never have a way to know, but maybe the issuer may need to know, okay? Because there is some national security behind, etc. So this is a critical question for policymakers when they will decide to launch an EID, a national EID, to say, hey, do I want to allow full anonymous actions or do I want to have a way so that only the state and the, perhaps the, the judge will say, yes, you are, I can find back who is behind that. And if Switzerland would do that, I would say, I'm fine, I vote for it. But if this is from uh, uh, some countries which are less democratic, I don't want that because if I would register to, to, to um, a newspaper of the opposition, I don't want to leave a trace that I'm registering to this, uh, to this newspaper uh, there, even for the issue of my EID. So these are problems of privacy which could be quite crit critical, and they are technical solutions for both, but this is a policy question uh, behind it. I completely agree, absolutely, with this stance, okay? And uh, I agree that it is technically possible to do this. My question again is, uh, is this clear, uh, okay? Because the, what we see represented sometimes in uh, some of the um, uh, government stances, in some government stances is, okay, I want to, um, uh, to, to be able to do that, to identify somebody whenever I feel like, is to kind of centralize information, okay? Not a purely distributed, I want to know, uh, everything about everyone, and I will use that information uh, the best way possible in the public interest, okay? But we have solution that allows exactly, that allow exactly to do what, what Philip said. So my concern is, is that uh, clear to our legislator? What do you think, uh, Ether, about this uh, dilemma? It, it's clear through learning, and the legislatures, the agencies, wh whomever in government is, it, the time to, is now. This is not something that we're talking about that's hypothetical, futuristic. These projects and deployments are going on. You can Google and find them. Um, they present at conferences, they do meetups, they do webinars. Um, the projects, for instance, CETA is out talking at the ICAO symposium two weeks ago showing the digital travel credential in use. Go out and watch and learn and dig into it. And it's from there, from seeing how it's actually being deployed and used um, by average travelers that you can then start focusing on what are the standards that are working? What are the challenges that they're facing right now? Instead of trying to legislate something that's so far off that's still shiny objects, or what if, or if that. Let's start looking at what's going on now and take the lessons and start starting to say, these are some of the immediate standards that we can see and agree on. We see the next layer of standards based on this, but those recommendations are based on what's being implemented today. Thank you, thank you so much. I think that providing that some that many opportunities for all stakeholders get together in one place. This is what Begin is doing. For example, so I, ha I can provide two interesting examples. The first example is the so example of the JFSA, Japanese financial regulators. Interestingly, that the JFSA send, is sending one young government officials to Georgia University to learn about the blockchain technology and its governance. So it is a good opportunity for government people to learn about the cutting edge technology and what that implication of that technology. This is one interesting use case. That the other case is at the beginning. For example, that you know, part of you know, FATO is so enforcing a travel rule to all uh, blockchain uh, exchanges, basks, or something like that. And but uh, so, yeah, you know, FATO is a, that 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 the mandate mandate of the FATO is enforcing the AML KYC uh, kind of thing. And but. Uh, 
at the same time that so the sa there are the same common issues for fat of and the blockchain engineers. For example, so ransomware. So when that some cryptocurrency is used for ransom payment, so both that blockchain engineer and the fat of would like to stop that ransom payment. So at the beginning that so we uh, worked uh, that the Gcash and Dash guys uh, worked working with part of guys to create uh, some report, research report, to how we fight against the ransom payment by using Bitcoin. And uh, so this this study report includes that some technology countermeasures and uh, so operational countermeasures, including that using card coin or something like that. But uh, that kind of joint work is an excellent uh, opportunity for. To, to all stakeholders understand that other stakeholders' thoughts, but because that part of guys can understand that so state of the art of the privacy enhancing technology and how to revoke that that technology for special case, and of course that that so Dash and the Gcash and the blockchain engineers can understand what the government officials is thinking. So this kind so preparing that kind of opportunities is very very essential to have that good understanding for all stakeholders. And I, I agree that the partnerships, the working together between government and the blockchain technologies, for instance, when it comes to identity, if there's one thing that governments do is they do issue identities. Um, but now a lot of times those identities have been pushed off to federated identity providers and therefore removing the government's ability to necessarily control the data that they've pushed out to these federated identity providers. But by working together, governments can take this technology, um, for instance, in decentralized identity, and now be able to issue digital verifiable credentials directly. But here's where it's important. It's not just governments on the regulation and compliance side. It's also governments looking at how can they reduce their own costs. How can they create their own efficiencies? How can they can streamline and better serve constituents in this new digital world that we all live in? And so if anything, blockchain and decentralized self-sovereign identity have given government the technology tools that they themselves can take a lot of the technology back that they gave to federated identity providers and be able to have better control over the data of their constituents and of the people that live in their countries, and they can do that again. So much of our data that was given to governments have been given to these third parties. In the US, we've had situations with IDME where we were required to give our biometrics or whatever to access our own tax records to a third party. Well, now that's not even needed anymore, and governments can remove that third party and once again be in control of how they issue the identity and how they keep in control the data associated with it. I completely agree with you. Uh, just uh, 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 an enact that from, from, from Italy, what it seems to me is, for instance, I'm talking about the country I'm coming from, is that the public discourse on identity is completely saturated by federated uh, um, identity, and that's a problem. Okay, so they're saying, oh, we had, we reach great goals, okay? We reach, I don't know, 60%, 70%, 80% of the population now have an electronic identity. They're talking about federated uh, identity with all the drawbacks that you correctly uh, highlighted. My concern is that what I see is that that seems not a point, okay? Not a starting point, but a, a, an achieved goal, an arrival point. Okay, we made it. Now people have, uh, uh, digital identity, and they're talking about federated identity. It's like, you know, things beyond that are not even uh, on their radar. So that is. I, I completely agree. And the top five questions I get calls about is how can I reduce my federated identity invoice amount? It is a very expensive proposition, and it takes the data that the government is entrusted by the constituents by their citizens, by their residents to hold, and it has shipped it off to an organization that is monetizing that and charging them a lot of money on top of it. Yes. And so we're in a position where governments can not only learn and write legislation and policy, but governments can also help create efficiencies 
strengthen the trust with their citizens and their residents, um, and also save money, which in Absolutely. the economic environment we're in now is necessary. You know what happened in uh, uh, um, you know, the last year? In Europe, we had to, you know, um, we, we, we put in place this mean to show that you were vaccinated to access public places, okay? And the interesting thing is that this was not done through the rated identity, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it would have been possible to do that, okay? Look, imagine if I every time I go to the to the restaurant, I have to triangulate with my identity provider. That would not be possible. And uh, when it was needed to have some sort of functioning digital identity, they have to use. It was necessary to use something else, which is much more akin to self-sovereign identity. Okay, this green pass, as we call it, it was a sort of credential signed by an authority. You could show it with your. Uh, you know, it was coded with, with a QR code, so everybody was able to um, verify that it was correctly signed. So it's like, okay, this saturates, federated identity seems to saturate the horizon of identity, but whenever it, it is really needed to uh, provide some kind of digital identity, then you have to go in the direction of social learning. Right, and blockchain and ledgers and chains are what empower us to get to the next phase, phase beyond federated identity. Blockchain empowers us to move beyond and extend it. And, and it makes federated identity, now you can start seeing that chapter closing in our technology history book. Let's hope. <laughs> okay. Now, oh, sorry, Philip. There's a, uh, a curiosity that arises from your story that you share with, with from the um, uh, Swiss government. It was about voting on something. Okay. Because voting, I think, it's a very controversial application. Okay. So when you uh, talk about possibility of electronic voting, okay, many uh, objections are. Uh, rising, okay, oh, that's not possible, uh, the, the privacy concerns, freedom of choice, okay, and so forth. Some of them, I think, are, I, I find them um, can be shared, but most of them, uh, according to me, uh, show an ignorance of what is possible to do right now. So, as a perspective, far perspective application that involves privacy very much. What do you think about this per se? Will it be possible to, um, to, to, to vote uh, electronically? I mean, definitely. And in fact, we, we, are, we are working on this, uh, on this topic and we have all the architecture. We did not prototype it yet for time reasons, but uh, <laughs> where the privacy is, push, is pushed to, to the extreme because this is typically the uh, subject, at least in a country like us, uh, where it should be pushed to 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 to, um, <clears throat> to the furthest possible uh, uh, direction. But going about the ignorance, there was an example. Uh, it was ten years ago. Uh, uh, Switzerland said, asked to a professor, "Could we use blockchain for voting?" And basically, the answer of this professor that I will not mention was no, because you, there is a law in Switzerland that all the voting material should be destroyed one week after the vote. Uh, once everything has been checked, everything should be destroyed. And if it's written on the blockchain, we cannot destroy it because it's immutable. And this was a nonsense, because the idea is not to put the votes on the blockchain, but just the proofs on the blockchain. And thus, you can destroy all the voting materials, which would be digital files, etc., and the proofs they are there, linked to nothing. So this was a typical example of, uh, of, um, um, of ignorance of this type of, uh, of things. And I think going back to the title of the panel, which is privacy versus immutability, I think when they, there is a, um, a misunderstanding <coughs> quite often about the, this immutability, immutability of data. And in fact, the idea is that the blockchain is granting the immutability of the proof linked to this data, and not the data itself. And the data can change. We could revoke a data. Uh, we could change. Hey, we could say, "Hey, this data was wrong." Thus, we revoke it, and we will create a new proof saying that. And thus, 
the immutability is about the proofs and not about the data itself. Thus, it allows, going back to what we said at the beginning, it allows to, to take care of privacy in the, without any, any it's, problem it's if a, it's done right. It's very common misunderstanding. I agree with you. Heather, what do you think about voting? Will we ever? Is it possible? Is it possible not only to do that technically, but also to uh, explain or to convince that it's not problematic. Yes, and I believe we will vote using a ledger in our future, absolutely. But I also say start small, start simple, and scale. So before we say, okay, we're going to use a blockchain technology or verifiable credentials for a, a, a national election, <laughs> Let's start on voting for awards. <laughs> Let's start on voting for um, elections for some of our local volunteer organizations. As a technology, as an industry, let's start building the voting components of this technology and using it for companies who have board of directors who need to vote. There, there are votes that actually need to be recorded and immutable. And let's start small scale. And then through success, through proof of success, we can build the trust of countries, of states, of regions to move towards this technology for actual voting for public office. But I think it's a stepwise approach before we get there. And it absolutely should be, because we are going to learn along the way Absolutely. and we should learn in lower risk uh, voting scenarios than we are in a, in a let's say a US presidential election okay. <laughs> but in fact okay. we, we do, oh, sorry sorry that is, okay so one of the my research areas e voting in 2003 or 4 and uh, so you know that, that there are over 10 security and privacy requirements for internet voting system uh, blockchain so one one or two of that all, all requirement. Of course, that blockchain might be that good countermeasure for that, for some of that that those security concerns, privacy concerns, but not everything. For example, you you told about that so freedom of voting or something like that. That so the technical word is receipt freeness. You know that if my my data, so my voting data, is um, uh, you know so so. If adversary can guess that, so the, so I I voted to that, so Biden or something like that from my my encrypted data, so so this is a strong strong receipt to that the person who buy my my ballot, so this is a so we sh we should so prevent that kind of uh, that kind of thing things uh, by using some cryptographic tools. Blockchain is not the countermeasure for that kind of threat, but so we have the long history of the cryptographic research to fulfill all all security and privacy requirements, and I think that combining blockchain technology to all and all our old existing research results could help to achieve that goal of the internet voting. In, in fact, this is really the combination of a digital identity, because you have to prove that it's yourself and then cryptography, and then the blockchain just to guarantee that uh, everything is done, uh, is, is done right. But going back to what you, you said about uh, starting small, in fact, we, we, um, we, we did some work with a county uh, in the US uh, to secure not the vote, but the voters' registries. Uh, because there is a lot of, uh, of uh, question whether the voter registry is up to date, etc., and uh, the, the Russians who try to, to make some mess uh, there. But then the question will not be technological for e-voting. In the US, it would be a governance problem because you have to convince more than 8,000 jurisdictions, which are independent from each other. That's the first thing. And if you think about Switzerland, this will be a psychological uh, barrier uh, for, for, for the, the, the people who say, hey, but what's about that? It worked for 200 years or more. Uh, we don't need these type of things. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. I would thank all my fellow panelists. I think we kind of, uh, we, we, we dealt with many aspects of this, uh, uh, of this uh, dimension that is very much important in, in blockchain. So thank you so much. I would like now to know if there are questions from the audience so we can maybe, okay, we have a raised hand side. Hi, it's uh, Wakas from RSM Netherlands Consultancy uh, Emerging Technology Team. 
Uh, my question was that with the issuance of uh, CBDCs, what do you see the role of uh, regulators which will shift towards actually implementing the regulations towards probably also monitoring the transactions? Um, wouldn't that conflict with actually the uh, basically the the implemented principles of the democracy because it's it will also be the privacy concerns as well? Um, and also, what do you think of the possibility of having a having a separate DLT based uh, system uh, through which probably per legal persons or natural persons can access CVDCs through financial firms instead of directly uh, dealing it with the central banks. Maybe I can ask. The, I can answer the, the first one. Again, a CBDC, the governance of a CBDC will be defined by the state itself. So if you think about the CBDC which is in force uh, in China today, of course the privacy uh, content is very different from a CBDC that we could imagine here in Europe. Uh, there are not any uh, running today. But uh, so it's up to the states to decide and as citizen will accept or not and thus will use it or not. Uh, and if a Chinese like CBDC would be uh, introduced in one of the European country, probably almost nobody will use it. Um, and thus it will just exist but with no use. Uh, but I would say as citizen, we can just accept or not what the state will, will decide. And I leave the others for the second. I, I can add, add for CBDC and the ML, KYC, ML, CFT thing. In my understanding that, so the ML, ML, KYC regulation is aligned to the part of guideline first. And the, the second, that, that each country create that their, its own regulation for each country. And at, at this moment, well, please correct me if I'm wrong, but as at, at this moment, most of central bank uh, don't have the obligation to do some ML KYC uh, process. It depends on the discussion, the governance of the CBDC. So, for example, that currently that financial institutions have the obligation to ML KYC process. And if that, so that discussion that each country want to maintain the same same kind of framework that financial institutions should have that obligation to do that. But I'm not sure that it's uh, it up to that future discussion on the governance of CBDC. I, I look at this from the KYC perspective of CBDC. And um, from governments, how do you digitally know who the individual is or who the individual is at the company or organization that holds the CBDC? And that is a crucial part. And if the technology and the approach and the architecture that you're using to prove that is based on the digital identity that we have used up to now, it is insufficient. A good test to that is if the KYC digital identity process involves a username and password, it is insufficient. There are better ways to do that now, and your policy needs to make sure the username password is not a part of your KYC digital identity process in defining who that individual is that is holding or is attached to the CBDC that's been issued. Completely agree. That's a prerequisite for doing that. We're on the same. Well, are there any questions? OK. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Antonia Eilander, um, and I'm a corporate and tax lawyer, and I specialize in crypto assets. And I'm a little bit sad that we're not going to talk about tax in this conference, because OECD is actually the birthplace of most tax treaties in the world. So I just wanted to say that I'm super excited about uh, software that's actually, I think, funded by the European Union that is going to annihilate VAT fraud with the blockchain technology. So my question is, your feeling about this, does it feel right? Do you think countries will implement it fast? Um, do, do you have an opinion on that? And, and thank you. It, it happens that I, I, I have worked with, on this uh, field and published a paper with Jeffrey Owens, uh, the former OECD um, um, lead in this, in this domain. And I would say, to my knowledge, there are not yet any solution which would remove all the, all the fraud, uh, the VAT fraud, especially the carousel fraud. But there are a few solutions which could help. 
Um, and and uh, in fact, uh, my colleague uh, um, Jérôme Duper and myself did write a paper on that, published in a book from Jeffrey, uh, where a simple, in fact, a simple QR code, but secured through the, the um, uh, 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 blockchain trust anchor, allows to say that this invoice is coming from a company who is doing this type of business and I'm allowed to invoice for so much. And typically in carousel fraud, a very small company which could disappear in one day, which has no business at all, could sell for hundreds of thousands of mobile phones. But if they would put such a QR code on the invoice because this is required by the law, then they would be discovered right away by the buyer that this is indeed a, a shadow company uh, there. So there are solutions. But then it's a question, again, of awareness of uh, governments and, 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 um, and uh, administrations uh, to say there are some solutions. Let's, um, uh, let's implement it. And some solutions are very big, very broad, and difficult to, to, um, to implement. And some are very simple and very, very small. So happy to discuss with you afterwards. Thank you so much. Yes, we have one raised hand over there. Hi, Nir Hirschman, Israeli Crypto Companies Forum. How do you think that um, how do you think that we can uh, delegate the regulator's appetite for surveillance regarding CBDC? When we're talking with regulators in Israel, they're talking about CBDC as a form of following citizens and a form of surveilling uh, bank transfers between people and they're not really looking into privacy issues. So how do you think we can delegate it to the regulators? How do you manage with that appetite? I, I, I don't know if that's a question that we, I, I personally can answer from a technical standpoint. I think that's a matter of uh, democratic control over uh, what we expect from uh, such a, uh, from, from such an instrument, and uh, I think that one important thing is that people, users, should be extremely aware of what will happen with such tools. Okay, what will be what, if, what will it be possible for uh, for institution for central banks? What will it be possible to know about what people do with their money? Uh, with their transfers, and then they will I, hopefully <laughs> decide with the democratic tools that, that they have if they indeed want this or, or not. So I think in your question, the thing that we can do, the thing to which we can contribute is to make it clear what it is possible, given a certain architecture, what it is possible to do. People has to know have to know this, okay? And then, of course, they will... Uh, decide whether to accept that or not. As Philippe said, uh, you can also decide not to use such a tool. It has to be a, there, there must be an opt-out possibility. This is one of the tools that we have. Sorry, Heather, if you want. <laughs> that the underlying technology that is used for that identity component is not a proprietary federated type of architecture, that that is a, uh, open source component architecture that at any point you have the ability to remove all correlation involved. So as the policy changes, the technology doesn't have to be ripped and replaced. And what do I mean by that is that you can have exchanges of value and information and you can change the governance where the technology doesn't have to be changed. You remove all ability for correlation at the root of the actual architecture. And if there is correlation, it is done at the policy level, not because the architecture of the technology forces the correlation. And part of the challenge we have up to now with digital identity and being tracked everywhere, it was the technology was forcing the correlation. And because it allowed for correlation, everyone took advantage of it. So start with the root technology that does not require correlation in order for it to function. Thank you, Ether. Are there any 
Other questions I think we have to maybe we reach our time limit. I again would like to thank you. I had a great time. I think we uh, made some uh, interesting discussions. So thank you again. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you.